forces a jump with it this time, and they both stand shielding in the gun smoke, but eventually they both back off again, pops him up with a bomb, and... Hello everyone and welcome to the ECAC. We are wrapping up the regular season here for SSBU and this should be a fun one. Win and in for the majority of teams here. We are going to be covering Florida Atlantic versus Randolph Macon this week. My name is Soy, alongside me is Kilo Miles and this matchup should be a ton of fun. Yeah, like you said, Soy, both of these teams have a chance at playoffs if they take this one home. For, I believe, FAU, it's not quite guaranteed. It depends on the results of some other matches elsewhere out in the wide blue yonder. But up until that point, they don't know. They don't care. you got to maximize your chances every way you can. you got to secure this win. And that is going to be difficult because both of these teams have fought long and hard through the season. Ups and downs, peaks and valleys to get here. Is, it is the four seed versus the five seed here. FAU comes in at a three and three record. If they win, they are on to that postseason. But if Randolph Mackin are able to, uh, or Macon, excuse me, are able to pull off the upset here, it, like you said, kind of depends on a few of the outside results. Muskingum and uh, Bishop Smash, their matches are going to be uh, playing influence into how the whole bracket of this elite group four breaks down. But three spots are locked in there. St. Joseph's, they qualified as the one seed. Bayrend and Dallas Baptist are also guaranteed to be going on to the next round. So it's really who takes that fourth and final spot here. And this is a fun matchup that we've got here in this best of three crew battle format because you look at the cast of characters and the players that we've got on this team and it feels like when you look I, in particular I think at Randolph Macon's lineup there's a lot of characters that are very good and get a lot of mileage out of punishes. Yeah and that's really I mean I say it basically every week here so it it's the number one thing that gives you a comeback mechanic. I mean, you can have a comeback mechanic inside the game, but I feel like being able to convert off of the smallest of hits is the biggest determining factor on whether or not your character can clutch out games. You can't be depending on winning neutral every single day of the week. You've got to be looking big conversions, and that's what we're hoping to see now. We've, we're hearing that the game is ready. And it's time to kick off this qualifying match, Soy. The regular season finale, Florida Atlantic versus Randolph Macon. Three, two, one. Go. Excuse me, versus Pichu to round thing or to start things off here. Joe Bob entering the ring first for Randolph Macon. See what they can do here. The other side of this matchup, Florida Atlantic. That makes this uh, kind of character dynamic so interesting. There's so many characters on FAU that do such a good job of controlling the pace of play and controlling the neutral. It's going to be up to players like Joe Bob to really make those punishes count. Yeah, I'm immediately a little bit terrified, boy, because it is a character who gets a lot of mileage off of rising aerials. How are you going to get hit you with a rising aerial? I guess like that when you land right on top of your shield. But it's going to be so difficult to get the smallest of conversions. You've got to get throw setups. You've got to find alternatives. Because going for approaching rising aerials is never going to work against this character. 
Rinse and repeat, and they get caught as well. It's going to be the forward pass to steal away stock number one. Joe Bob hung out to dry on that recovery. And now, this is going to be difficult. Low percent is where Pichu shines. THD4 is already putting in some work. But might need to work on that a little bit. Because now we see an opportunity for but I love how even though it would have been good to just take a second and refresh your mind, TFD, they're right back into the fray of things. They're already stacking on the punishment as Joe Bob is trying to get these little neutral wins that could lead to a stop, but that's all they are, especially when THD is able to convert off of Thunder Jolt. Cannot find the back air either. 104 now onto Joe Bob. How do they make it back to stage? Pichu so good, so fast at controlling, but now they find a grab into a neutral air. And this is where things can get kind of scary, right? In the red here, Pichu, one of the lightest characters in the game, but it sends a down smash that will catch, and it will kill off the side, and that's strike two off of Joe Bob's stocks. Ooh, fighting right through that aerial, and I love that Joe Bob goes there. You had to go for a home name. Every opportunity for a kill, you need to take it. But Joe Bob is now on the ledge again. He would fight through those Thunder Jolts using invulnerability and fast recovery, fighting at the ledge right there. But it's eventually THD who gets the advantage. They're going in now. I, I love that. Joe Bob waits, does not get antsy, but now they're in a dangerous position. Check underneath, good grab there underneath that down B. 104, 115, and that one stock can make all the difference. Get up attack, we'll give them a second chance here to try and seal it away. Arrows are connecting as well. Have to up the back of the ledge, down till it won't connect. Oh, they went for the side B, and they go for the down B. The spike that time will not land. The cloud unable to bring that back down to earth, and they reset once more. 158 tries to get in, rolls in that time around after the neutral B, and that time he'll roll inside to a forward smash. It's a one stock game. Delays in the air for so long avoids that too. Joe Bob is actually forcing THD towards the ledge. THD, it looked like they, they had this match in the bag on stock one, but this first stock almost never tells the story of the full match. Joe Bob is mounting a slow, steady, and dangerous comeback. That grab can mean everything though. Barely gets that down beyond in time. Just barely could not read the direction off that throw. Can he find another landing? The down smash was so close. And roll in up smash will do the trick. And that is how the first member of Randolph Making goes down. FAU hold a one stock lead. And that right there, so it is. I. My heart dropped a little when THD4 did that up throw and did the thunder, because this whole game started on the narrative that Joe Bob could not use their rising aerials, couldn't get conversions going. And then THD drops a kill confirm right at the end because they go for it against a character who has a frame, I think, three or four combo breaker? I'm just saying, a little bit of poetic justice, but THD able to defy odds, defy prophecy, and take down Joe Bob. But they hemorrhage two stocks while doing it. And after how dominant that first stock is, that can't feel good. THD is going to have to pull themselves together because Pichu is not a fun character to play with one stock on the board. Yeah, very difficult. So many moves in the kit of Pichu damage your character bit by bit, even though it is only, you know, fractions of a percent at a time. Uh, throughout the course of a match, it really does add up, especially when you're on such a light character, one of the lightest in the game. And for Randolph Macon, there are so many heavy hitters still in this lineup, a lot of characters that can really make this uh, this Pichu struggle. And one of them Ooh. coming out here, the Incineroar entering the ring here for round number two. And this is not going to be easy, but this is the double-edged sword. Yes, uh, we talked about how Pit gets all his mileage off of rising aerials. In Cineroar, it's all about the falling aerials, coming down like a guillotine to take down the stocks. The unfortunate thing is, it's just like a guillotine, it's a little bit unreal. And uh, Johnny Gold Apple is going to have to deal with the fact that they're going to get comboed to nines. But just a huge, strong falling aerials is all they need to get this Pichu to kill the center. Feel like oh. a 
feel like for TH, the game plan is just get the Incineroar off stage, right? There's so much mobility you have with Pichu. In theory, you can get the edge guard very cleanly and quickly extend the lead. And that's just what's happening here. Neutral Beast connecting, and the upbeat just doesn't have the range to be able to get back to the ledge. And that's how stock number one goes off the board. Never seen Pichu utilize Teasel as an edge guarding tool as efficiently as THD4. They're so good at uh, just non interacting with these recovery. You have to put yourself at risk to deal with. Forcing Johnny and Golden Apple to go high once again, recovering on a stage now. Equal percent opportunity right here for a reversal. Holds the shield, holds the line though, and THD4 is able to re establish advantage. So close there, but this is where things get dangerous. Again, that rising back air will knock them off stage. Jump use here. Early up B, and they won't go to the ledge this time. They'll land on the Pichu and get some good damage online. But another back air will send Incineroar off stage. Johnny Gold Apple is forced to recover low. Get up attack, just barely connecting through the down smash, saving his stock there. That was surely the end of that one. The neutral air will knock him off stage again. And he lands on stage, and that one will not work. The down smash connects, and it's two stocks off the Incineroar board. HD or what a player right here. Right here. Uh, conversion. Can you get a little more? No tech on the platform. Intelligent by Johnny Golden Apple. But even that neutral reset is enough to get yourself back in the advantage. It's too quick, too simple. Not falling for that counter whatsoever. I don't think I've seen a revenge counter happen off a non tejo once. THD4. Now it's to recover a voice in two frames. Right here, though, that's gonna be it. You hit that side B, you know that Pichu is going off the side. And now. Finally, the rat's reign has ended, but at what cost, Soy? You threw so many resources into this Pichu, and now you've got four stocks left to deal with whoever is in the back half of this roster. That's scary right here. Five stocks taken in total by TH. That is an impressive run from the Pichu. And it feels like, again, Johnny Goldapple had decent chances felt like okay maybe they can get something going but they just never got their you know feet off the ground in this series th was all over them combos galore and like you said not a single revenge really able to land they had to panic up b out of some combos towards the end there and every time they tried to land on stage the first one worked but after that it was caught time and time again by th making good use of that down smash too just a coverall for recognizing, you know, like you said, Insurer wants to land with some of these hitboxes, and they're if they're able to play defense, play a little bit more patient, they'll be able to get a strong punish off the back of it. And there's just this instinct that TH demonstrated throughout it all of knowing exactly when T, uh, when Johnny was going to go for a counter hit or a counter itself. And TH would always just back off, drift away like a ghost, and then coming right back, they're able to get a very good reversal as uh we got a little mac uh this is i mean it's gonna be a swingy matchup for sure uh little mac is going to have some trouble dealing with incineroars uh jump first speed uh, incineroar jumps fast he lands fast but besides that he is He's got really good anti-soil, and that's what's got me worried, because Incineroar can't be that tricky with his drift. If he goes in, you know he's going in. Good amount of damage landed early on here. 55 already onto Johnny Goldapple. The other part of this, too, right? Johnny Goldapple now with only one stock. He's sending Little Mac, who's... You know, even though, in theory, this character, you might be able to take advantage of some weaknesses on them, it is a character with a ton of kill power, as they're going to be immediately sent off stage. Another catch, and good night, goodbye. No, not yet. They're able to survive. A B gets revenged instead, and that's the end of stock number one of Conundrum. What an efficient edge guard right there. Covered every option, and Conundrum used every option. But even that little bit of Victor is overshadowed by the fact that the Nunder is able to finish the stock, and now that's five stocks on the side of Florida Atlantic, and one player left to take them all down. Now, whoever this last player is, all they gotta do is do exactly what TH did to them back to the other team. It's not that hard, right? It just happened to you. We'll see if they can actually get that done, because we still don't know who's in the anchor for FAU.
<laughs> yeah, it's going to be a difficult task. And uh, Conundrum, they drop a stock, but again, you know, not too much to it outside of getting caught on that one edge guard. Uh, you know, I will say FAU, typically we've seen the same three players throughout most of the season, Conundrummer, uh, TH, and Calamity. Uh, so I'm assuming that Calamity is likely the anchor here, and I believe they play King K. Rule as that, that third uh, member of the squad. But FAU has been very good in matchups like these. Whenever they have been the uh, the underdog, they have uh, struggled. You know, their losses are to St. Joseph's, Bayrend, uh, uh, Dallas Baptist. But their wins have come against all of the teams below them in the rankings. Uh, Five Towns, Bishop Smash, Muskingum. So they are the favorites here in theory. But you got to play these matches out. And Randolph, Randolph Macon, I mean, you know, they are a strong team. They didn't get here by accident. So we'll see what this last member can bring to the table as the Donkey Kong enters in as the third and final member of round number one for Randolph Macon. And you bring a little Mac to a stage with a triplat. And I'll be honest, I'm not that excited about this. While you might think platforms, I can just circle camp Little Mac, are you actually going to circle camp with Little Mac as a burst option to cover top platform and so many tech changes he can do on side platform? I mean, Aeneas just spacing with four tilt right here. The Canon Drummer has having none of it. Gets grabbed though, run off stage, and oh, goodbye. So that's the game plan. That, that, <laughs> that's the play. Sometimes it's just that simple. Stock number two gone from Conundrummer. Ooh, good mash out there right as he was about to get thrown back towards the stage, but instead, reversal here leads to an upbeat. Only maybe able to grab the ledge, but wow, swinging everywhere was Conundrummer, and somehow, well, it will result in a stock down smash, just barely able to clip before grabbing the ledge. Oh, that was such a clean conversion. I gotta say, Soy, all these players in the back half of the or of the uh, open season are great at converting right off of the angel platform. First it was TH getting that immaculate edge guard right off of the angel platform, and then immediate dash tack into raw back air back air. I mean, it's not the flashiest combo, but it's the efficiency. It's the immediate, like, didn't even register that the stock was gone. It's like, okay, my turn. <laughs> Yeah, right back into things, right? No time to rest, no time to think about it. And they immediately are able to convert. And like you said, not just the the, the efficiency, but the recognition. They find that play immediately. And all of a sudden, it's not it's no longer a you know one stock game. Okay, now it's reset neutral. It's a I'm in advantage right from the get go. I know exactly what you're going to do to try and get out of it. Catches him with the second back air. And that's the end of that stock. So now we get to see the last member of FAU, likely Calamity here. We'll see what character they opt to play. Maybe it is going to be the Donkey Kong Country matchup here with the King K. Rule against DK. But I think, again, it is still a, a tall task here for Aeneas to be able to bring this back. If it is truly the King K. Rule, I mean, heavyweights are meant for taking stocks and trying to hold on, but it's also easier said than done, especially with the way that Florida Atlantic's got so many characters that rack up the damage so quickly they do but all these characters are exploitable in one way or the other um as we just saw with conundrum and we got a sephiroth taking the stage for calamity this is an interesting one i i mean sephiroth believe it or not is a glass cannon uh i mean he's so light he's so light and much more than that he He's got a lot of single hit moves. Donkey Kong has some super armor. That is something that you can take advantage of to approach when Sephiroth thinks he's safe, thinks his range will keep him at bay. But an approach, approaching giant punch will armor through most everything Sephiroth is going to throw at you. So you got to watch out for that. But even so, Calamity is still able to get the advantage in the neutral at first. But Aeneas goes straight for this edge guard. No hesitation whatsoever. I like the idea there to try and get aggressive too, kind of forcing a low recovery from Calamity in that situation. Now it's a grab here. Goes for the back throw off of it. It's forward tilted instead. 
Knee is looking for an open. They find an up tilt. But the up B onto the stage will actually knock the Donkey Kong away for a moment. Calamity looking for an opening. They won't find one. Stuffed out by the down B into the up smash. And it's a tie game in terms of stocks. Right, and immediate ding dong. Goes for the nair extension, but Calamity knows that they can nair right out of that. And he is caught in the landing, but they're able to get down to that. Gets the trick. Now it's Aeneas who might have the advantage, but the tech animation, no! Several pancakes under that, a little bit of missed spacing, but Aeneas still manages to hold on to advantage state. Ooh, nearly caught the air dodge ring with that up smash too. Calamity though, gonna get caught again! The we will rock you! <laughs> Down B the up smash! And all of a sudden, Aeneas is on the verge of the comeback! Gets a grab as well, won't be able to follow up off the back of it, but he still has DK punch. Air dodge is in, caught by the forward tilt, and that recovery will get stuffed out by the counter, and it's a tie game! Playing around this center platform is the most terrifying thing you, can, thing you can do right now, which is so weird for me to be saying, because this top platform is supposed to be good for Sephiroth, but Aeneas is cowboying off of it like crazy! Calamity, get out of there! Underneath it for the moment, 46 to 34. Forced to the ledge once more, he'll go back to it. Now trying to get around it, but he gets caught. Back air, strong hitbox as well. Pass to recover low, countered once more. Rinse repeat, no, this time around he goes for the up B and it does not catch. Aeneas is back on stage, gets a grab instead. He'll turn around, got the tech on that one. We'll be able to make it back to the stage for the moment. Goes for it all with a forward Ooh. smash, and he is punished accordingly. Calamity's forward smash will land, and FAU takes series number one. What a comeback right there. I was so worried after the momentum started shifting Aeneas' way, but that momentum was coming a lot off of those spot dodgers. Spot dodge, spot dodgers, like, whoo. And then all of a sudden, Calamity called it. He called it out hard, and that's all you need to do. You never punish a ha I I'm firmly of the belief, you don't punish habits when it's like the beginning of the match and they're not going to lose that much out of it. You let them get comfortable with it. Some might call it conditioning, but at the end of the day, it's just letting them be the architect of their own destruction. And in that situation, too, Calamity, I, I feel like uh, actually Aeneas in that, that final stock almost got too ahead of themselves. They got a lot of good punishes. They got those stocks very early. They were, you know, mixing things up. The down B combos were able to take stocks off the board, but they get the down B into a grab there. They try and go for the off stage counter play as well. They make it back to the stage and then they go for a heavy forward smash read. They were charging it for a good second and a half there and it gets called out immediately the second it doesn't land by the forward smash of Calamity. So well done by Calamity to... You know, stay poised. Even though the momentum was tilting the other direction, they're able to still clutch it out. And because of that, FAU now have the series lead. 1-0 here, the best of three. Can they take the second one is the question, or will RMC change things up? Because it did get very scary at the end of that match. Here is what I'm thinking right off the bat. RMC did not get really anything out of Joe Bob. And Joe Bob's, like, they got the two stocks, but that was Joe Bob fighting hard. That was Joe Bob fighting really hard. If they could somehow orchestrate it, so instead it's Joe Bob going up against Conundrummer, and then maybe Johnny Goldapple takes on TH04, I feel like er, that would be so much better. Because uh, that little mech is going to be hampered to the nine hells uh, by those arrows. Just constant pelt of dark arrow, dark arrow, dark arrow. And you saw Joe Bob was not afraid to use them liberally either. And the other side of it too was just the fact that, that TH04 was able to uh, just get so many stocks. It almost feels like, I mean, Pichu is the, the glass cannon or double-edged sword here of FAU that if they work, you can get a ton of mileage out of them. But if they don't, all of a sudden, the, a comeback feels less and less possible, right? It feels like you have to get a certain amount of mileage sometimes out of the out of a character like Pichu. And that's why TH04 has been so successful. The weeks that FAU have won, they have had great performances. But the question is here, how do RMC slow that character down so that they have a chance at the rest of the lineup? That is a tough one, because there's no one on that uh, roster 
that's just, oh, obviously that person beats Pichu. Um, I feel like of any of them, it would be... Oh, this is a tough one, so I, this is a tough one. I think it might be Johnny, because at the end of the day, Johnny was getting knocked around. But you do, all you need to do is get a couple... Actually, no, Johnny lost two stocks, and Pichu only had one. Oh, man. This is a it tough is, one. It is the dilemma, right? Because in, in terms of, like, I agree, on paper, Incineroar feels like the best character to try and deal with Pichu. But if that is the, the best case matchup, and it was still a, a two-stock differential, I'm not sure you want to lean that way again. And on the other hand, you could say, all right, well, what if we go lean even heavier into it, right? Pichu versus something like DK, because of the way that uh, Aeneas was moving at the end of that game. Donkey Kong feels very strong, could, be, uh, could potentially take a bunch of stocks off of the Pichu. But on the other hand, that is the classic, you know, field day for Pichu combos. So it feels like somehow there has got to be a change here for RMC to try and bring this back because they just do not have an easy answer for uh, for Pichu. But outside of that, it feels like the momentum is there. They've got the matchups that they like. They've got uh, the ability to take stocks off the board. Maybe they switch things up here and... Uh, there are a couple different players. I believe there's about four or five players on RMC. So maybe we get to see that that uh, fourth or fifth member. I know Tundra Tortuga is on this uh, lineup somewhere. So maybe we get to see them in this next crew battle. That's what they're uh, debating right now. They're going through picks and bans for that second matchup. But FAU, do they even change their lineup here? I'm always a fan of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But it is a, a wild mind game, I think, that these two have to now play. Oh, it actually does look like Tundra Tortuga is going in for Johnny Goldapple. Okay. And it's going to be Tundra versus TH04 to open things up. This is an interesting one, shaking things up. We talked about how there's no clear combo whatsoever, but it... I, I just took another look at this roster. <laughs> Soy. There are, like, few matchups that I watch in Smash Ultimate that make me go, oh, this is unwinnable. Because I think almost every matchup is winnable. And they are, technically. But have you ever watched Peach Pikachu and Pichu flail against a Game & Watch player? It's not pretty. There are no conversions. Nothing you do is going to connect. You can't touch them in shield. You can't approach their smash attacks. You can't T-Jolt too much because they will bucket you. This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> this is bad for TH04, one of the strongest players in FAU. Uh, TH04 is going to have to pull out a miracle performance right here, assuming Tundra does in fact go Game & Watch. But if you have even a pocket Game & Watch, I think there's almost not an excuse not to use it against Pichu right here. And on the other hand, too, right, it feels like the game plan is simplified, right, for, for Tundra Tortuga. Because, like you said, there's just so many easy uh, counterplay options. But it's a matter of, uh, I guess, piloting, piloting them properly, you know, making the right decisions here at the right time. Don't allow TH04 to grab that momentum back because... Randolph Macon had the momentum at the end of that series. We'll see if the lineup switch is enough to throw a wrench in FAU's game plan. FAU would love a second chance at the top three teams that have already qualified out of this group, and they will have it if they are able to secure one more series, and they get two tries to do so. So let's see where we end up going. Stage selection, I believe they're still uh, picking stages as uh, as they're going now. It looks like PS2 is the pick makes sense <laughs> and the only question i have uh is how quick is th04 going to adapt because the main thing about all this about the fact that um game and watch is hard for pichu is that you just have to play a completely different game you have to play game and watch's game and the game is watching. 
You just watch for your opportunity, you get stray hits, and then eventually you find a strong kill move to kill. Every low tier main will be like, that's just how I play the game. <laughs> that's just how the game works. But Pichu doesn't work like that. Pichu, you look for openings, you look for conversions, you look for kill confirms. Not against Game & Watch, you don't. Not against someone like Tundra, you don't. You gotta adapt quickly. You gotta realize you're not playing Pichu's game anymore. And we'll see if TH is going to fall into any of the classic Game & Watch traps. TH is looking for a challenge. See how warm Tundra's hands are, too, after sitting through that first series. They enter here as the substitute for round two. Can they be the difference maker? So far, first 20 seconds or so, it's Tundra who's finding first bits of damage. But you can see that TH starting to change up the pace a little bit, but they get caught here. No tech on the main stage, and that means they're going to take some damage. 55, they go off stage for the down air, getting aggressive early. Up smash nearly kills at almost 50%. A ton of knockback on these smash attacks for a game to watch as well. Something to watch out for. Yeah, TH4 trying to play the range game, but using Pichu's agile speed did not get caught out of shield. I feel like cross-up Nair is the one advantage that Pichu has in this matchup over Pikachu. Pikachu's not really going to cross you up that much with Nair, too much hit stun on that, but Pichu can just fly on by you, and that little advantage might be all you need. Landing with the Nair right there is enough to start a combo, but nothing much. TH4 does not overcommit whatsoever. Low recovery here, they roll behind, they try and throw out the forward tilt, but instead they are denied. Tech chase here, TH04 does not find the follow-up top after two strong down tilts. They do not get the, I think, follow-up up air. They get clipped off the ledge once more. A B out of shield will get Tundra to safety for the moment. They grab the ledge, but they are caught by the neutral B. Dash attack, again, spot dodged away. Just too difficult to really land something strong against this Game & Watch. Now they find a back air, all the hits connect, so away goes the Game & Watch to the other side of the stage. Forward smash won't land, but dash attack is punished! Up smash will connect, and it's the first stock going to TH04. Game & Watch is a lot of things. He's a firefighter, he is a chef, but he's not a fisherman. And you wouldn't know it by watching Tundra, because with TH4 at this high percent, they're fishing. Just running up forward tilt, running up forward tilt, going for back air, back air, back air. And they're just not connecting any of them. TH4 is weaving out, and even though Tundra is throwing out these kill moves, TH4 er, has not been getting caught by them whatsoever. Even there, rolling around the back air, they nair the forward air as well. They are playing a bit more patient right now, and they are being rewarded for it. They get a grab here, back throw off stage. Look for another neutral B, it does not connect. They won't be able to catch them off the ledge either. Down smash from Tundra will not land. A neutral air, or sorry, an up B will knock TH04 off the stage, and the neutral B will clip them into the chair, and that will be the end of stock number one. 56% lead here for TH04. Make it even more here off of the grab. Can they find something else here? They get instead reversed by the grab. Now neutral air will lead to an up air. Help chip away at that damage, but both very light characters. Things are still trending in FAU's advantage. Cool. Now, tech opportunity. Doesn't get caught by that forward air. TH4 is just being a little more aggressive than Tundra Tortuga is expecting, and that's giving a lot of opportunities for uh, TH to just beat out the bomb altogether. So, using the bomb as a spacing tool just is not going in their favor whatsoever. Back throw now, and the opportunity for an edge guard. Chef is on the board, gets the two frame with the bomb. It's not good as an approaching tool, but as a follow up, the alley oop is all you need. Twice now, the neutral B has caught on the ledge and led to the end of a stock. Neutral air will land here, 25. They try and cover the platform, but instead they are knocked off stage. 141 here on Tundra Tortuga, and they will die to the forward smash, but the down smash was so close to landing. Could have been everything there, but instead it is a tie game once more. Two hits of the bucket here online. They catch the jump as well. Low recovery forced here, but they opt to just back away. Instead they get grabbed off the neutral get up, and the neutral air will land once more. And look at these percents, just about even 37 to 45. And in the same way, Game & Watch is too light for a lot of confirms, so is Pichu, but it doesn't matter. TH4 is very low, and gets caught right there! What an um, 
impeccable recovery right there. Conventional wisdom is that you do not edge guard Pichu and Pikachu. You just kind of sometimes go for a two frame, but not this time. Not against a player like TH4. You gotta go off stage. You gotta finish them off, and that's exactly what Tundra Tortuga did. Now, wasn't as clean as maybe it could have been, especially as it looked from that early stock where it looked like TH04 couldn't play the game. TH4 played an immaculate game to get around that losing matchup. But Tundra Tortuga went above and beyond, especially towards the end. Oh, those conversions off of the uh, two frames with the Chef. Chef into Ford Air. And then going all the way down, trusting in the hitbox of your up B to convert into a ledge grab back air. That's awareness right there. That is awareness of the matchup, awareness of your capabilities. Fantastic stuff right there from Tundra. Yeah, really well done, especially on that last stock to get the timing right. Like you said, going down, dipping down, knowing that THO4 is likely going to recover with something like a side B that they use to try and just get closer. And then the up B has the distance to get there. Being able to get that exact hitbox, snap to the ledge, drop down, jump back air and get it off the board and take down a member that took five stocks in the previous crew battle. They have one stock remaining here for the side of Randolph Macon, but can they get even more? We saw THO4 extend the lead last time. Randolph Macon's Tundra Tortuga trying to do exactly that the other way, but they've now got to do it against Conundrummer's Pyra and Mithra. I love not even trying to go the Little Mac against someone like Tundra Tortuga, who will just back throw you and then just hold down Chef. <laughs> like, Little Mac's, what's he gonna do about that? Nothing. So instead you go Pyromithra, you get that powerful tool that is the Nair, you get down tilt as a poke option, and you don't get to use any of them, because Tundra Tortuga is playing a very good spacing game. Be very difficult. Dash attack in here, Conundrummer. Able to get a, uh, a conversion there and tie things up in terms of percentage, but now the reversal from ledge. Can they get anything? They get two neutral airs, but not enough hitboxes really connect for them to get anything more. Back air will stuff out that one. Up B will clip underneath here. And so far, is really just back and forth between these two. Trade after trade, run underneath, up smash, and now we get to see Pyra. Ooh, just forward tail. Prominence Revolt, though. Doesn't get punished. A little bit of miss spacing right there by Tundra Tortuga. Now, misses a nine right into the blazing edge. Now, to the standoff at the lead. No one pulls the trigger. Instead, Conundrum lets them get back onto the platform. And I do like, in theory, doing the Prominence Revolt onto the platform. The problem is Game & Watch does so much juggling. It doesn't matter, though. Gets caught by the down air. Tundra Tortuga barely surviving. Barely, but barely is sometimes all you need. Goes right through the blazing edge, but great roll right there by Conundrum to avoid that down smash. Up there connecting underneath. This stock means so much, really. Being tied or being trailing, entering that next match. Could, meet, could make all the difference. Both these teams have been in a ton of close matchups here. But they're looking for one strong hit. Up B will not connect. They're able to air dodge to the platform as well. Up B will knock them up high. Conundrum are trying to land. They are able to do so. The side B gets fully shielded. Run up down smash instead. Going to be forward tilt to knock them off to the side. They are still able to survive. Snap to the ledge here. Can Tertuga get out? No, they cannot. Forward tilt off the dash back. will catch them dashing in. And that means we've got a tie game here in set number two. It feels a lot like a tie game, Soy. It really does. And on paper it is, but you got to remember in that first crew battle, we saw FAU take five stocks on the back of TH04. This time only three. That means that it's going to fall to Conundrummer and presumably Calamity to take down more stocks than they had to previously. Now, FAU still looked pretty good all throughout that, but I don't know. Randolph Macon is playing with a new fire right now, so I'm liking what I'm seeing. They're putting in a lot of work, it's showing, and there is a real opportunity for us to go to a third game here.
Very, very close. Conundrum are here. Uh, I think a key moment to hold on to that stock. They drop that stock all of a sudden. Randolph Macon has a you know stock advantage headed into the next match. They get that counter pick advantage as well. And like I said, towards the end of that series, they've been in a lot of close games. In fact, Randolph Macon has had, I believe, three of their six series go to set number three. So they have been in a lot of tight games throughout this season and a lot of extended series. Whereas FAU, it is mostly just two O's or O twos. It is very, very clean for them. These uh, wins and losses. So curious to see where Randolph Macon go here. Also curious, like you said, uh, the character swap here off the little Mac makes sense, but to Pyramithra, we don't know how much action this character has got from Conundrum or how practiced they are. They seemed pretty solid overall in that game, but it was just one stock. And now they have to go up against Randolph Macon's captain, Joe Bob 64. Joe Bob, a player with a lot of experience under their belt, but how is it going to serve them here? Now, I feel like we're going to see a little bit of a different Joe Bob because they couldn't really play their game last time. No, none of Pitt's real conversions. Nothing with those rising air nares and fares like we're seeing here. 51% off of those rising nares and fares. Great little extensions to of the very tips of the hitboxes. I'm liking what Joe Bob's bringing to the table so far. Tried to land there and get something off that down air, but instead, not all that much. Tried to track them down, but just too fast as Mithra. We'll find another side B, but the sidestep around it actually means they get the dodge. Conundrum or force off stage. Pop by one arrow. They side B in, and they almost thought they were just low enough, but they are able to make it back, but only for a moment. The side B once more from Joe Bob will connect, and that's stock number one off of Conundrum's board. Cool. Gets up in the air there. Joe Bob putting in a lot of work right here. If Joe Bob gets a stock lead here, yeah, I don't care how good Calamity is at the end, it's going to be tough to get through both that DK and Joe Bob's remaining stocks. You got to play cautious, you got to play prepared. Joe Bob now on the ledge, it's caught by the Pyro Conundrummer. Drummer. Opportunity for a finish right there, but knocked away from the ledge when Pit uh, considers to be a very easy character to edge guard. You can't let yourself be slipping at the ledge. You got to shield those dark arrows and be ready to get the edge guard. Conundrummer is starting to get aggressive here, and he's finding success. He goes for a run in down air, or uh, a down air off the play off of the side B, and he ends up fighting an up smash off the back of it to take that stock off the board. But now he's just going in repeatedly, and now the arrows are starting to really rack up the damage. 139 onto Conundrummer. Repeated back airs will mean that Conundrummer is forced off stage once more, but now maybe a conversion of their own. The shield being held out for so long means that they only find really two hits. Dash attack nearly kills from center stage here for Joe Bob up tilt will not land, and now Pyra is out to play. Yeah, board tilt not gonna connect. Joe Bob does not go high. But a Providence Revolt. I, uh, I like the idea, so because it would kill if they caught Joe Bob in the jump, but if not, it just sets you up for such an easy punishment. Conundrummer has to be aware, has to be prepared to be punished for that, and that down smash, or down air to up smash doesn't connect either right here. Joe Bob is keeping Conundrummer in the air. Trying to find another opening. He gets the jump as well. Conundrummer is in quite the conundrum themselves right now. They cannot land against Joe Bob. Another Nair connects. Arrow finds only a shield. Another one this time. But the side B will be able to knock Joe Bob away for the moment. They will be able to get to the ledge thanks to their own side B. Forward tilt thrown out. But it's only going to find shield. And Joe Bob will look for another up smash. Arrow to punish, just chip, chip, chip away, and they will find another side B, and down goes Conundrummer Joe Bob with a two stock lead. You know, so a funny little thing happens when good players play good characters that they're not really all that familiar with. They just do the best option over and over and over again, and. They just haven't had the experience on that character to break that habit. Did you see every landing down air that Conundrummer went from? That's the best option for Pyro to do in the air. But over and over again, 
when Joe Bob is punishing it every single time, that's where it hurts. And commendable play from Joe Bob right there. Seeing, oh, they're down airing every single time they're landing. It's a consistent cadence, and I can get used to that. So every single time they'd land, dash tack. Every single time they'd land, up air. They'd wait for the down air. Joe Bob would rush in, get a small punish, and extend this juggle situation. Disciplined, clean, slow chip damage, but consistent. And that's what the important part of it is. The other thing, too, that was so consistent, the use of the arrows repeatedly. And it did not matter the distance, either. Whether Conundrummer was on the other side of the stage or right in their face at times, the arrow was always just covering the base platform, um, you know, forcing them to pick an option, shield, or do something. The arrow was ever present in that matchup, racked up a ton of damage, and really uh, helped uh, Joe Bob get Conundrummer up to the range where they could find those kills, find those up smashes, find those side Bs. And now we get to see Calamity, and they're back to the King K rule this time of a character we didn't see in that previous set, but we brought it up earlier. Let's see how the big croc does against Dark Pit. So King K. Rule is not just the King Croc, it's also the King of Reversals. Counter hits are King K. Rule's best friend. With Super Armor Nair, Drift Back Back Air, just like that. Gets a reversal out of Joe Bob's own combo. This is where we're going to see Calamity shine, and if they can leverage those into kills, like we see other K rolls like Copal do from Northwood, then this is going to be a big, big momentum swing. But that's the problem, it has to be a swing. You need to find those opportunities, and Joe Bob doesn't seem like the one to give them up easy. Ooh, that up air nearly killed it. It was at such a surprisingly low percent, but now Joe Bob looking for their own combo starter on these nares, but they will not really find much. They opt to just back away. Now they get in with the neutral air. They'll find an up air here. Landing on the platform with a nair was calamity, but again, how do they get in? How do they get the damage? They find a dash attack here. It's a soft hitbox, but it will knock Joe Bob off stage. Up B down low rides the wall, and now he cannot make it back. The neutral air intercepts. The cannonball will connect. Thought it would drop sooner but instead joe bob flies into it and they are now down to their last stock good awareness right there by calamity Just rolls away uses the super armor to avoid these multi-hits and then gets a landing there no real big punish off of it though because they know joe bob is going to be desperate to get advantage again and this is an opportunity a comeback of a lifetime right here if we're going to see fau somehow walk away with this win when it looked like Randolph Macon was on this insane run, neutralizing the key threat that was THO4, but it doesn't matter. Every single person on FAU is a threat, and you gotta respect them as such because now three stock versus three stock. Randolph Macon's counter pick. Where are they gonna go? Who are they gonna send? It all depends on this right here curious to see last time they ended up uh going with uh aeneas the uh, da uh the donkey kong as the anchor last time around but calamity was on the sephiroth as the counter pick and it did not end up or nearly ended up going against them now the king k rule you saw the movement there felt very practiced even though they only found some soft hit boxes here or there at times it felt like okay they understand the spacing the movement of this character and what like you said well tho4 i think is a big focus because of the character they play calamity i think has more often than not been the anchor of this squad constantly being the third man in and being the one that fau relies on in these moments so now how do Randolph Macon counterplay against Calamity's three stocks of King K. Rule? That remains to be seen right here. This is interesting to me. Because it was Calamity who chose to go Sephiroth into that Donkey Kong. And my question is, why? Like, like <laughs> what was the mentality there? Because if Calamity is, in fact... A K Romain, which they are, like it's obvious. Were you withholding information? Do you think K Roll DK is a bad matchup? I can't honestly say if it is. I think DK probably combos K Roll pretty hard, but also doesn't have the frame data to get true combos every single percent. I'm curious right here. I'm very curious to see what the counterpick is from Aeneas because 
I would think the Donkey Kong. But why was Calamity wanting to play Sephiroth over the K. Rool? Another very real option was Information Denial. Do you think that could be it? Maybe. I mean, also, if you in a in theory, right? You've got a set to play with off the bat. You know that you're guaranteed at least two sets with a playoff spot on the line. Seems like a risky maneuver to go with that pick. And they may not have known what uh, Aeneas was going to bring to the table. We go back to Yoshi's story, a stage that we really don't see all that frequently here at the ECAC, but Aeneas, certainly a fan of it. We'll see what they can do here. Remember, if Calamity clutches up this match, FAU, they get the victory this week and they are on to the postseason. But can they do so here? Oh, they try and change things up at the back here, but no dice that time around. Ooh, great match right there from Aeneas to get out of there. If you're gonna be cargo throwing people, you gotta be ready for the fact that you can mash. And, oh, that's why Aeneas has been bringing the Yoshi story. That actually makes so much sense. Walk off cargo throw is lethal. It's capable of almost 80%, and Giant Punch almost killed it at 90. And on a uh, character like Cable, it's a ludicrously low percent. So we gotta see these strong hits coming out from Calamity too, because otherwise you're just gonna get grabbed and hauled straight into the blast zone. <gasps> what? Miss Punish goes for the up smash instead. Don't, does not find anything really off the back, but they will eventually take that stock off the board, but it, it could have been a much cleaner conversion and he eats a little bit of percent for it anyway. 60% now onto Aeneas. They'll be able to recover high and get to the platform. But it is still dangerously close here. 13% Calamity off stage, and oh no, I the, the missed an input there. They don't up B, and all of a sudden a stock gifted away by Calamity. This is not good. I mean, we've seen Calamity get oh. crazy reversals. So it's an even game here <laughs> in what could be the deciding match between FAU versus Randolph Macon, because, well, now both players, they're sobered up. They're ready. They're very lucid and immediate jab combo. Any one of these hits could be lethal. That's how efficient both these players are in their conversions. Gotta be very careful here. One opening could mean everything. Oh, he wanted the back air, but he could not get it out in time. The up B beats it out. That's gonna be a ground off the, off the side B. He goes for the DK punch, and instead he gets thrown off stage for it. The cannonball will land. Goes for the counter, but it's too low here. 64 to 86. These are big bodies, but they do a ton of knockback. These are kill percents, really. Walks off stage. No tech, and he doesn't get the back air. Nearly reversaled for it. Footstool instead. K. Roll can make it back with his up B. Now he gets grabbed and back. 99% recovering low, and he counter. clips him just in time. The Nair will knock him off stage. Calamity's forced to recover Giant low punch. once more. Can he get back on? Can he find an opening? Fade 99, and that's going to be another back throw, and he still won't die because of it. Neutral air into the <gasps> cannonball, and Calamity is clutched up again. FAU are still dancing. They will go to the postseason. What a scramble right there at the end. Each one of those players looked like they had that in the bag in so many moments. The cargo throw, and they walk off stage, and they do it into the stage, hoping to get a spike, but then Calamity doesn't tech, and I think it was intentional, because they bounced out and then went for immediate back air. They were looking for the spike, but they didn't give it to them, and then the Nair... I, I swear, I didn't know what Calamity was going for every single time they walked off stage directly into DK's recovery. I thought it was a counter, but no, it was the Nair into the cannon this whole time. What a showcase of everything your character can do, everything they can almost do when you're just a little bit off of your execution. Fantastic stuff right there. FAU with a 2-0 victory and an exciting finish. And what a crazy sequence at the end, like you mentioned. So many scramble situations, so many close calls, things like the hitbox of the up B recovery from uh, from Donkey Kong clipping, right, on the attempted Nair edge guards. Even in that moment, I don't think that uh, neutral air offstage kills unless it hits the cannonball that was out there preemptively. What a play from Calamity. And even when things looked like they were out of reach for them, they were able to rip that momentum away, take it all back. And Florida Atlantic.
go four and three through the regular season. And with that victory, they have secured themselves a spot in the postseason. They will be in the top four of the group. Congratulations to them. Randolph Macon, so close, but congratulations to them as well for their regular season efforts. They had a, a lot of ups and downs, but you can see the talent on this team growing. Yes, you can. And now we're going to turn our eyes to FAU. We're going to try to get an interview right here with Calamity if possible. So do not go anywhere. We're going to try to get this interview and hopefully we'll be back to hear a little bit more about what, what FAU is looking forward to in the postseason right after this quick break.
Welcome back, everybody, to Esports U. We are here in the aftermath of a incredibly exciting 2-0 with the architect of that 2-0, Calamity. How you doing? Hello. Good night, everyone. And I am doing swell. I, so I got to ask, take us back to the moment when you actually got the conversion to finish off that stock. What was that like? So... When you play Cairo for four years, you know, starting out, these sort of conversions, they seem hard. And, you know, you work your way towards them. But when you've grinded enough with the setup, it just comes second nature. To be honest, sometimes I just fire a cannonball. I go down in there. They just happen to hit the cannonball. And what you saw was one of those moments. Second nature. <laughs> Well, we love to to see it. Uh, Calamity, you know, so this FAU squad, I mean, it's been a pretty consistent three names that we've seen throughout this season. Uh, but I feel like you guys have been pretty well-rounded. And although there have been some ups and downs, do you have like a favorite highlight of the season thus far? Well, tonight has just become <laughs> my new favorite highlight. What can I say? I mean, it's not this a bad one. It's not a bad one, of course, but I can tell you when I go meet the team again, uh, that's what they're going to be talking about that. I know that. So, yeah, this will definitely out. be a highlight to remember. You clutched it on two different characters, and I got to ask, why the Sephiroth at first? Well, since they had me anchored, I was thinking, you know what, as an anchor, because TL, well, for a bit of um, lore... I don't just main Sephiroth, I mean like five characters. And, you know, in my case, I have to pick and choose, okay, who's suitable for what character, what play style? And I thought, okay, this DK, I'll try to hit him with the Sephiroth. It almost didn't work because of how he played. So I'm like, okay, I, I was unfamiliar with your game, but I got it. I got the download. <laughs> Originally, if I was put in that same scenario, I was going to switch to Ganon. You know, bad matchup, but I am well versed in that. Okay. <laughs> and it worked out there. So uh, for this team overall, you guys are go four and three. You are going to be somewhere between uh, seeds three and four for the uh, the overall groupings, which means you're on to the postseason. So congratulations. I guess, what do you think your team needs to, to focus on uh, as you get ready for the postseason matchups? Okay, well... What I would say is, for Conundrummer specifically, uh, advantage, disadvantage, and overall more practice. For me, I need to play definitely more and verse myself and to keep my fingers warm. Since, you know, coming back from spring break, I was rusty. But, you know, you don't, you don't just drop four years of experience down the drain after one week. So I need to play more, need to work more. Uh, disadvantage, I th should also you know, coach more because I saw when, when Conundrummer played, I'm like, okay, you're doing good here, but you're missing these optimal punishes. So I think me and Conundrummer just need to work, get better at advantage, punishes, etc. Neutral especially. Uh not excuse me, TH4. He is my goat. What can I say? His P2 is inspirational. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was gonna ask if you wanted to shout anyone out, but I think you just kind of you kind of did that. <laughs> um, oh, but uh, so yeah, shout out anything, to the FAU teams. Yeah, any last <laughs> other statements you want to say now that you're qualified for the playoffs? <laughs> well, I had a request. Someone told me to say on your. I was told banjo is top ten. I'm just putting it out there. An anonymous source whispered to my ear, "Banjo's top 10. Maybe in a task. Maybe in a task. Well, <laughs> yes, yes. It, it, it's perhaps. on the public record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Calamity, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy your win, and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your night. Good luck in the postseason. And to you as well. Thank you for having us. All righty. Well, that is it, everybody, for Super Smash Brothers Ultimate Florida Atlantic University 2 Oh, against Randolph Macon, but 
This is Esports E, and we got Esports every single day of the week, and tomorrow at 8 p.m. EST, it's ECAC Valorant. It's going to be Eastern Kentucky versus Farmingdale State, so be sure to tune in. It's going to be beautiful, Crow and Shibby on the mic. You know it's going to be exciting. You know it's going to be fun, and so many playoff qualifications are happening, so tune in then, 8 p.m. EST. But for now, I've been Keel Miles. This has been Soy. Hope you all have a wonderful night. Take it easy out there.